just like take a hose, you know, and spray it off afterwards. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay, can you go set that up?
of bread.
Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the American Fork 22nd Ward Sacrament Meeting. Um, presiding at today's meeting is Bishop McBride, and he's asked that I, Brother Andrew Jones, conduct. I'd like to also recognize uh, Brother Gordon from the State High Council um, on the stand with us as well. We uh, have a handful of announcements. Um, big, big thanks to all those who participated in the stake ironic priesthood encampment this past week up at Granite Flats. Um, it, was, it was it was a lot of fun, and there weren't there weren't as many injuries as we had planned for, so that was good. So we, we got under that, so that was good. Um, we also I like to again that there's a lot of a lot of effort that goes into that between logistics and and and. Uh, and just being up there support, supporting the boys. So thank you for all those that were able to uh, make time for that. Uh, we've also have this Wednesday, uh, the 29th at 6 p.m. There's a stake uh, activity for the for the youth ages 16 and up. So that's for the priests and for the young women, the older uh, young women as well. And that is at the North Building. It is a barbecue, games, activities. There may be some water games there, so we be pre prepared to get wet, but um, there will be dinner there. So it's at 6 p.m. at the North Building this, this week. And then the week after that, we have our Independence Day Ward Breakfast, which is our, fourth, our Ward 4th of July breakfast. It will be on, that, on the 4th of July on Monday. And so look for uh, different signups for some food assignments that will be going around in Early Society and, and Elders Quorum today for that. And again, that'll be at the North Building at 9 a.m. And then um, the, the final announcement that we have, again, is the, that 4th of July week on that Wednesday, there's an activity for the uh, primary children. So there's going to be a stake uh, primary activity Wednesday, July 6th. Again, it's at the North Building at the same pavilion that, we'll, that we will have been at the previous Monday. Um, and that girls are invited to be there from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and then the boys from 10 p.m. to 3 p.m. So there's a there's a lot going on in, in summer which is which is great. I uh, will begin by seeing him at 251 Behold a Royal Army and the invocation will be given by Sister Rebecca McBride. <laughs>
Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can gather together today on this Sabbath day. And we're grateful for the opportunity to be here and to partake of the sacrament. And we're grateful for the many blessings that we enjoy as members of thy church. And Father, we ask you to please bless us with thy spirit and please bless the speakers today that they may be filled with thy spirit and to be able to share the messages which they have prepared for us. And Father, we ask you to also please bless our church leaders. Please bless our bishopric and our stake leaders. Please bless our dear prophet. And please strengthen them and inspire them to make the decisions that they need to to best lead our church. Father, we also ask a blessings on the missionaries that they may find those that are searching for the gospel and that they may be able to serve those around them and bless them in a way that only they can. And again, we are so grateful to have the opportunity to be here and we're grateful for thy savior and we're grateful for the blessings that thou has given us and we say these things in the name of jesus christ amen, amen. thank you sister mcbride you may have noticed the we are missing an organ so that is by design it wasn't stolen or anything like that it's just going through if anyone finds it let us know no it's um it's just going through some cleaning, so we will be without it for the next few weeks. And so I'd like to thank Sisters Gillespie and, and Sister Stone for providing our, our music today. And we, will, we don't have any war business to take care of or stake business, so we'll move on with our administration of our sacrament, sacrament by singing hymn 188, Thy will, O Lord, be done.
specifically grateful to uh, our, our youth speaker, uh, Brother Bushman, Teague Bushman, um, as I've been able to participate in, in some of these summer camps over what they're learning and, and pushing themselves and proving to themselves that they can do uh, seemingly uh, difficult things, and I'm, I'm grateful, grateful to him. Um, he will be our, our opening speaker, and then followed by Sister Maria Tejmulia, and then we'll have an intermediate hymn, uh, 218, we give, thee, we give Thee But Thine Own, and then our concluding speaker will be Brother Tim Marini. So I'll turn the time over now to Teague. Hi, my name is Teague Bushman. Today I'm going to be talking about what I learned at the Youth Stake Young Men's Camp. I learned many things, but one of the most important things I learned is that the name of a person is very important. When God came down to earth to Joseph Smith, he addressed him by name. Second thing I learned is there are many different ways that people can be converted into the church. I, learned, I got to learn about many different stories of missionaries converting people. The third thing I learned is that many, many things needed God's help for the gospel to be restored. Joseph Smith couldn't have done it by himself, and he needed God's help. The final thing I'm going to talk about is the camp theme of trust. Many of you may know trust as a word, but at our camp we used it as an acronym. The first letter stands for truth. Seek after the truth because there are many different ways you can be misled. Satan, Satan wants to mislead us as much as he can, so try not to let that happen. Second letter is repentance. Jesus Christ loves us all very much and provided us a way to repent of our sins. Third letter is unity. Unity with others can help get more things done. I wouldn't have been able to set up my tent all by myself. The fourth letter is strength in the Lord. Through finding strength in the Lord, you can have a happier life. Final letter is testimony. Bearing your testimony can help others learn and grow in the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I wish we had Trek whenever I was a youth because it sounds pretty awesome. Today, I want to talk about a subject that sometimes may trigger us a little bit. You know, um, the prophecy foretells the last days in the most amazing ways. President Ezra Taft Benson says, the Savior's coming will be both glorious and terrible depending on the spiritual condition of those who remain. Strengthening our homes and fortifying our children for the world they face is one of the most vital and important roles we have as parents. And as we help them become strong spiritually, physically, intellectually, and as we help our children form a sure foundation in Christ that will help them withstand the winds, they can overcome the, the powers of the adversary. You know, in Helaman 5.12, we read the scripture, and I'm sure many of you seminary students could probably repeat it. In Helaman 5.12, we read, And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that ye must build your sure foundation that when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, yea, when all his hail and mighty storm shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe, because of the rock upon which ye are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. So how do we help our children build that foundation in Christ? And also, in particularly, I want to talk about this in relation to provident living and self-reliance. 
So I grew up in California in um, the Central Valley. And back in 1989, there was a huge earthquake over in the Bay, the San Francisco earthquake. Some of you may have lived out there at that time, uh, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It caused so much damage. It happened right during, uh, it was actually the, the Battle of the Bay is what they called it. It was, a, I believe it was the World Series between uh, the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's. And there was lots of things happening. And right around the five, six o'clock hour, the earth began to move and it shook and it shook. And bridges began to collapse. Over there in San Francisco, if, if you're familiar with the area, San Francisco is actually built on, uh, a, lot, a lot of the city is built on garbage, actually. Things that was put out in the bay and they build buildings on top of it. And so there they did not have a very sure foundation. And the city fell apart. Well, growing up in the Central Valley, not too far away from San Francisco, we in our home and in our schools, um, once this happened, everybody's big radars started to to kind of go off right like oh you know let's make sure that we're earthquake prepared let's make sure we're fire prepared let's make sure that we're prepared for for anything and so i remember as a young elementary school student that through my elementary school years we would be consistently having um, earthquake drills. We would, uh, in our classroom, there was a big wall of, of, of windows, which probably may not be like the best design element for elementary school, but whatever. Um, and so uh, we would practice getting under our desks and protecting ourselves in case those windows broke. And also at home, my parents put into place, they got, I'm not sure if you guys remember Mr. McGruff. Anybody remember Mr. McGruff, our preparedness guy, the dog that had those books? My parents would bring out the McGruff books and help teach us about how to, um, I don't know, put out a fire if it happened in the kitchen or other things like that and how to be safety kids. Well, being safe temporally is just one element of, of, of provident living and, and preparedness. But I wanna ask you for a second, and I, and I wanna invite you to, to have a little bit of honesty time here together, okay? Just, and I know that we don't raise hands typically in, in sacrament meetings, so I'm not gonna have people raise their hands, Bishop, so don't worry. By the way, Bishop is rocking the coolest socks, so whenever you see Bishop, you know, give him a high five, they're pretty awesome. But anyway, um, so nobody raise your hands, but as I ask these questions, if you feel like you are identifying with this yourself, just kind of maybe give me a little subtle nod um, and we can, let's see if this, this resonates with you at all. So when you hear the term provident living, what do you hear? Do you hear food storage? Do you hear emergency preparation? Do you slightly roll your eyes and think, not this again, again, again? Do you feel a tinge of guilt for not having a year's supply of hard red wheat? I mean, which, you know, you may or may not need. <laughs> Do you imagine your mom or your grandma canning peaches during the summer while you and your family or you and your, ki your siblings would run around and make messes and try to sneak some off the counter? Do you imagine stockpiles of food storage that you know that you should have, but or you should have rather, but you don't. And say to yourself um, that when, when stuff hits the fan, that you know we should be okay, but if not, we can just run over to the Mercolos, who by the way have like a Humvee and a big bus. Like we can just go help, they, they can help us, you know. Or even any of the Joneses probably have a lot of supply there, okay? Um, or do you think that it's just prepping for a disaster when you hear Provident Living? You know, whether it be your job loss, inflation, food shortages, um, or just anything kind of bad. But what if it didn't mean this at all? Any of those? At least not, doesn't mean that at all in its fullness. I propose to you that provident living and self-reliance is so much more than that is so much more than the temporal things that we often easily focus on. It's easy to focus on the things that we can see, but truly the things that we see, those, this food storage, the, the disaster prep, all of those things are just periphery things 
but, but truly at the core is a doctrine that is so powerful that if we understand and if we live, we will be blessed. Elder Hugo Martinez of the 70s stated, self-reliance is a doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a program. It's a process that lasts a lifetime, not an event. So if, it's, if it is a doctrine of the gospel, what does that mean? What does it mean? What kind of doctrine is it? What are, what are the principles? What are the parts of this doctrine? And how do we teach provident living to our children? I propose there are three main parts and three ways that we can teach it to our children and to learn about truly what true provident living is. First is to look to Christ and his example. Second is to help, help cultivate an action-oriented faith. And third is learn to love and embrace the principle of change. So first, let's look, at, look to Christ. Let's talk about looking to Christ. All right, kids, I am going to be focusing. This is something that's in a, in a guidebook that's written for you. Who here has a children's and youth manual? You guys can raise your hand for that one. Children youth manuals here. All right, have you know what I'm talking about? These came out just a few years ago and they're magical, they're powerful. It actually really hit a heartstring for me because I'm a huge goal setter and I love faith, uh, action-oriented faith. The children's guidebook says that when Christ was your age, he learned and grew. You are learning and growing too. In this Luke chapter two, verse 52, it reads, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So what does that even mean? Like, let's, let's break that down, that scripture for you guys. So when we look to Christ in ways to prepare and to, to um, be self-reliant, Christ, when he was your age, when he was young, when he was setting the foundations of his life, he did four things. He grew in four main areas. First, he grew in favor with God, spiritually. He grew spiritually. Second, he grew in favor with man. He made friends, right? Are you making friends at school? I know my children love to play with their friends out in the yard, and summertime is such a fun time to make neighborhood friends. Third, he grew in wisdom, or intellectually. Are you going to school, learning? Are you reading books? Are you watching educational shows? And fourth, the Savior, he grew in stature which is like a physical and taking care of his body. He learned to eat healthy foods. Do you think Christ ate healthy foods? Probably. I mean, he ate fish and honey when he came back, right? Like, pretty healthy. And you can eat, too, can eat um, healthy food and learn and take care of your home as well. As we look to the Savior's example, it can help us filter out things that are most important and teach us what things are not important in preparation. So if Christ focused whenever he was setting the foundation of his life, do you think that these are areas that we too should focus on as we set a foundation of our, of our self-reliance and provident living? I propose so. All right, second, let's talk about uh, cultivating, cultivating, excuse me, action-oriented faith. One of my very, very favorite chapters in scripture is Alma chapter 32. And most of you are familiar with it. It's a very, very um, commonly referred to chapter, very famous. This, the, in this chapter, we it talks about faith. And about it says, faith is not having a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if you have faith, you, have, you hope for things which are not seen, which are true. And Ella continues on to teach in this chapter what faith means and how to put it into action. And as I've studied this chapter over many years of, of growth and of life and then continuing to grow, I have learned that there are some core elements to being able to put our faith in action so that we truly can become um, the kind of person that our Heavenly Father wants us to come become. First, and, and these things actually follow along the principles, the, 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 what's called um, the, uh, the cycle of growth that is in the children and youth manual. The first one is, the first part of the cycle pattern for growth um, for faith is um, to discover, to discover. Just like in Alma 32, that he found that seed, right? That seed, he's like, I wonder if this seed is good. I wonder if this seed can grow. You too, as, as children, you guys can take this seed and discover, you know, what gifts and talents has your Heavenly Father given you? 
And you can pray to learn what they are and what Heavenly Father wants to look, you to learn, uh, work on now, right? Discovering that seed, discovering that seed. Then Alma says, you know what, he, what next to do with the seed? You have this seed, then you need to plant it. And in the, the pattern for growth, the next step after discovering is plan. After you discover what you, uh, you know, that what you want to grow, you can make a plan for how to do it. You plant it, right? In the seed, you want you, you need to plant it in the ground for it to grow. But what does it mean for your talent? Or you know, you can, um, you know, after you discover how you want to grow, pray and talk to your family about how to do it. Your parents are there to help. Make a plan. Your parents and leaders can and will help you. So make a plan. And so the seed, you plant it and start watering it. The next is to take action. After you make a plan, you need to take action on it. Faith and planting that seed is not enough. It is not enough. But sometimes, you know, it's easy to wonder, like, what action should I take? What action do I need to take? Well, talk to your parents and look at your plan that you've made and just take the first step. Take small steps and learn each step of the way and you'll begin to see, you know, is this seed growing? Am I cultivating this talent? Am I growing towards, closer towards my goal or am I not? And as you continue to act, is then reflect. As you see that your, your talents improve or uh, um, that seed to grow, that plant to grow, reflect and see what you've learned about our Heavenly Father and, and about how Jesus has helped you along the way and celebrate. Thank Heavenly Father for how you've grown and find ways that you've learned to serve others. And keep going and choose another idea and, and continue the cycle. This being able to act in faith and be able to take, take a goal, that seed, and be able to, to take it through that full cycle of growth is vital for, for our lives. While, you know, as a young kid, one of my goals, I started with, in, in learning the cycle of growth, I started with the goal of wanting to be part of a play. I went to a performing arts school and I um, always wanted to be like the star of the play, right? And so um, I, I told my mom, I said, mom, this is my goal. I want to, I want to uh, grow this talent. And she said, okay. And uh, so we started doing voice lessons. I started to uh, take you know, additional little opportunities at church to, to stand up and, and, uh, and speak. I started to do these little things that helped prepare and help me be able to cultivate my talents in, in doing a play. And when auditions came, guess what happened? I went up there and I was nervous as ever. But I did it. I sang and I, and I did my little monologue. And, and um, But guess what? I didn't end up getting the part. I didn't. But I ended up being on crew. And as I continued to develop my, develop my skills and talents, and as I continued to work, I realized that, that sometimes acting in faith, that it takes time. That it takes time. It takes us um, repeated action to be able to cultivate our talents and our skills. And while that was an example from when I was little, that skill of being able to take a goal and be able to make a plan and execute the plan and then reflect and then try it again and try it again has blessed me in our temporal and, and uh, self-reliance ways as well. It has helped me be able to, to um, in entrepreneurship, my husband and I are both entrepreneurs and we have built different businesses and done different things and it was those principles of faith, of, of being able to um, discover, plan, act, reflect that have set the foundation for, uh, for being able to create other things and be able to grow in faith um, with my Heavenly Father. All right, so first we've, we've talked about uh, the, the first two things, right? We, we have talked about uh, uh, you know, looking to Christ in his example. We've talked about uh, action-oriented faith. But what we also need to do is focus also on, and be able to keep in mind and learn how to love and embrace the principle of change. President Nelson taught that the word for repentance in the Greek and New Testament, Greek New Testament is metatoneo. The prefix meta means change. The suffix neo is related to the Greek words that mean mind, knowledge, spirit, and breath. Thus, when Jesus asks you to repent, he is inviting us to change our mind, our knowledge, our spirit, even the way we breathe. He is asking us to change the way we love, think, serve, spend our time, treat our wives, teach our children, and even care for our bodies. 
You know, sometimes when we hear the word repentance, um, we get a little knot in our stomachs, right? Anybody feel that, the little knot in our stomachs? Uh, we begin to feel less than or not enough, and we may get the feeling um, that we were when, when we were in trouble as kids, right? When we associate the word repentance with a less than, these less than pleasant feelings, we can often avoid thinking about it. And it's right there, but yeah, it's one of those things that's right there in the fourth article of faith as one of the first principles of the gospel. For me, however, the thought of continual change and improvement feels good. And that perspective shift that President Nelson offers in understanding the, the root of the word um, of, of repentance, of meta neo, that is change. It's elevating. It feels freeing. It aligns with what we know to be true about all of us, that we are loved children of our heavenly parents, and that through our experiences here on earth, we can change and elevate to become more like them. Think of that. We are meant to change. We are meant to repent. We are meant to grow. One of my favorite ways to be able to teach this principle of growth and change to, and, and repentance to my children is through, um, cultivate, is through this principle of cultivating a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is really important because, um, because this is where we are able to, because uh, when we're in a, what's called a, let me expl first explain what a growth mindset is and versus a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is whenever something happens to us and we say, oh, that's it, that's it, you know, oh, you know what, the, I lost my job, that's it, I'm stuck. Or, um, you know, I failed that class, man, I'm really bad at math, and I'm always going to be bad at math, right? Or even a fixed mindset might be, you know what, like, all that self-reliance self stuff, that's not for me, that's for somebody else, that's... I don't need my food storage or, or even like all this stuff, you know, I don't see how this all comes together, but whatever, you know, that is a very fixed mindset. And yet a growth mindset is one where we're able to say, you know what, like, huh, you know what, I, I lost my job, but guess what? Heavenly Father probably has something better for me out there. I wonder what's next. Or, you know what, I failed my math class, wow. I must not be good at math yet. I wonder how I can become better. Or, you know what, yeah, I, I might not feel like I'm super prepared and, you know, spiritually or temporally, but I think I can change, just even slightly. I think I could, I think I could maybe do one thing to, to help me on my path of being able to, to, to become more self-reliant spiritually and temporally. And being able to teach our children just those simple things, of being able to, to look at whatever's happening around us and say, huh, how can I grow? How can I change? How can I improve? Um, and take ownership over their thoughts is, is very powerful in being able to um, be, be strong in these last days. President Hinckley shared um, that he shared this quote that I, that I want to uh, share with you today. It says, he says, we of this generation are the end of the harvest of all that's gone before. It is not enough to be known as a member of the church. A solemn obligation rests upon us. Let us face it and work at it. We must live as true followers of Christ with charity towards all, returning good for evil, teaching by example the ways of the Lord, and accomplishing this vast service that he has outlined for us. May we live worthy of this glorious endowment of light and understanding and eternal truths which has come through the perils of the past. Somehow, among all who have walked through this earth, we have been brought forth in this unique and remarkable season. Be grateful, and above all, be faithful. So as we think about, and as we, as we, um, as we think about, uh, you know, how to be able to, to cultivate this um, how do I say it um, as we as we try to cultivate being uh, the provident living and spiritual self-reliance and temporal self-reliance it's important that we remember that we are meant for this age we have been built for this generation and that as we look to Christ in his example 
as we help our children cultivate action-oriented faith, and as we learn to love and embrace the principles of change, we will be able to survive and thrive in this, in this beautiful time of, that, we, that we live. We do not need to be victims of, of, the, of the things that are happening around us, but rather we can take action and ownership and be able to, to um, be true, uh, true saints and, and be able to continue to grow. I testify that I know our Savior lives and that he is guiding us and that he wants us to, uh, to become more like him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hello, I'm Tim Marini, um, and as Brother Bushman said earlier, it's important to know names. So my name kind of squishes together, so Tim Marini. And we've lived in the ward for about five years, just over five years. My wife Rachel, my son Wyatt, thanks guys for coming. Glad you're here. Um, I wanted to start just because real quick, it's, um, it's still June. And it's still, Father's Day is still kind of in my mind, and my dad's been kind of swimming through my mind and my thoughts lately a lot. Uh, I lost him to a brain tumor uh, in 2006, so I've been missing him. Um, he's a very introverted man. He was very organized and very literal and deliberate and very logical. And I remember he was asked to give a talk one Sunday, and I don't remember what the talk was or what it was about, but I remember his thought was, and he said, you know that we're asked as um, Christians, as believers in God, that when we pray, we kneel. And we should also practice that when we're asked to give talks in sacrament meeting. And I think he said it a lot funnier than I just said it, but anyway, I wanted to... Anyway, so, quick um, summary. We're gonna talk about three, three topics from Elder Uchtdorf's talk back in April called Our Heartfelt All. And uh, we'll talk about tithing, and we'll talk about balance, and we'll talk about the difference between sacrifice and consecration. So Elder Oak, so, why do we pay tithing? And the tithing is just an example of how we give our all. And why do we pay tithing? And some of you might um, think we pay tithing to support the church, to help pay for the church buildings and maintenance and buildings and temples and, and pay utilities. Also, maybe to pay for church organizations and you know foundations and charities. But and that may be true, but we pay tithing because we are obedient. And tithing is, is a law, that, that, a commandment we've been given. And if we read, and you guys have heard this, in Malachi, he says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I think we, we hear that enough to where we may skip over that and kind of dismiss it, but I feel like um, if we think about those last several words, prove me herewith and I will pour you out a blessing that there shall not be, there shall not be room enough to receive it. And to me that is 
that is significant. And, and, and while the scriptures are, are somewhat full of metaphor and sim- symbolism, I feel like with tithing, that can be very, very literal. I asked my wife to help me a little bit with my talk. Um, we, as a couple, uh, since we've been married and, and whatnot, have learned many times over the importance of obeying the law of tithing. And this is one experience she related. Shortly after we got married, less than six months, we were very poor. Rachel was working a temp job for a barely minimum wage and I was working at Office Depot, not much more than minimum wage. With all our bills, we simply didn't have enough money. However, we knew that paying our tithing was essential. So with an extreme amount of faith, we wrote the check and wondered if it would, if it would even clear. The next day in the mail, we got a refund check from our car insurance company. Who knows when or if we overpaid. We called and made sure, but there it was, a check. And then also in the same mail delivery, we got another refund check, probably from a bank or something, some other company. But between those two checks, it was the exact amount of money our tithing check was. We deposited them quickly before the tithing check cleared and it didn't bounce. Since then, and among other so many experiences, we've gained such a strong testimony of tithing. And in his talk, Elder Uchtdorf began with relating the story of the widow's mite from the Bible. He said, just days before he gave his life for us, Jesus Christ was at the temple in Jerusalem. He was watching people make donations to the treasury. Many that were rich cast in much, but then along came a poor widow, and she in, she threw in two mites, and a mite is a very small amount of money. It was such a small amount, it would hardly be noticed and be worth recording in the temple ledger. And yet this seemingly inconsequential donation caught the attention of the Lord. In fact, it impressed him so deeply that he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasure. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. With this simple observation, the Savior taught us how offerings are measured in his kingdom. And it's quite different from the way you and I would usually account for things and measure things. To the Lord, the value of the donation was measured not by the effect it had on the treasury, but on the effect it had on the heart of the donor. Before I continue, I want to, because it relates, I want to quote my favorite scripture. And if you've known me for a of time, I probably told you. It's my favorite because in my mind, it brings our entire meaning and our mission of this earthly experience, our lives, into very sharp focus. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 82, verse 10, it says, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. But when you do not what I say, you have no promise. I'll read that again. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. But when you do not what I say, you have no promise. So think about that for a minute. When the widow cast in all she had, the Lord took notice and was impressed. I want to clarify that what I said above about paying tithing is simply about obedience. While that I feel is true, the reason we are obedient stems from our desire to be more like the widow in the above parable. We truly desire and are willing to give the Lord all we have. While the payment of tithes is a commandment and is very specific, we can all exercise our our obedience in our own ways. It's personal between the Lord and ourselves. <clears throat> and, and we hope that the Lord takes notice. It's personal. It's not just about numbers. And if you know me well, one of my favorite things to say kind of sarcastically is it's just math. I'm not a fan of math as it's consistently one of my weakest subjects in school. It has been. However, when I recall DNC 8210, 
To me, that's a simple math equation. We obey, the Lord blesses us. He must. It's eternal law. When we don't obey, the Lord probably will bless us, but he doesn't have to. He's not bound. With how challenging and difficult this world is, I absolutely need and plead for the Lord to bless me and be worthy of that. The second topic he mentioned is balance. And <clears throat> let's see. Okay, this is a quote from his talk that he talks about balance. He says, similar principles apply when it comes to finding balance in our lives as G disciples of Jesus Christ. How to distribute your time and energy among your many important tasks will vary from person to person and from one season of life to another. But our common overall objective is to follow the way of our master, Jesus Christ, and return to the presence of our beloved Father in heaven. <clears throat> this objective must remain constant and consistent, whoever we are and whatever else is happening in our lives. And I feel it's very important because, and this is back to the whole idea of, of the widow's might, where we might be inspired and feel that we need to give everything. And while that should be our desire, I think we also need to be wise and prudent and, and, and not take give everything literally but if we have that desire in our hearts that's where that needs to go uh, quickly the last topic he mentioned and this is something I haven't really given much thought to but there is a difference between sacrifice and consecration and let me let me sum this up with what he said sacrifice means to give something up in favor of something more valuable anciently God's people sacrificed the first things first things of their flocks and honor of the coming Messiah. Throughout history, faithful saints have sacrificed personal desires, comforts, and even their lives for the Savior. We have things large and small. We all need to sacrifice in order to follow Jesus Christ more completely. Our sacrifices show that we truly value what we truly value. Sacrifices are sacred and honored by the Lord. So to me, that feels like a sacrifice is something you're trading for something. So I sacrifice my time and I get blessed by, you know, whatever, whatever I get for that sacrifice. So if I give 10% of my, my, my income, then, then I get the blessings from being obedient. Now, consecration is different from sacrifice, he says, in at least one important way. When we consecrate something, we don't leave it to be consumed upon the altar. Rather, we put it to use in the Lord's service. We dedicate it to him and his holy purposes. We receive the talents that the Lord has given us and strive to increase them manifold, to become even more helpful in building the Lord's kingdom. So I hope that makes sense. So consecration is a more meaningful and deep uh, sacrifice. And it, the idea is to to give for the betterment and to be active as opposed to more passive. Very few of us, he continues, will ever be asked to sacrifice our lives for, for the Savior. But we are all invited to consecrate our lives to him. And real briefly, I just want to you know, testify and conclude by, by saying that uh, I'll invite you to go read that talk again or listen to it. It's an amazing, amazing talk. And it's very enlightening and it, and it taught me a lot. And I hope and pray that it, it reached somebody's heart here today. I testify that the Lord lives and that he loves us and that he will notice and appreciate and, um, and, and give back even more uh, for our sacrifices and our consecration. I love you all and I love this ward and this lovely family that we are. And if, um, if I haven't met you in person, come up and say hi to me and I'd be happy to, to get to know you guys better. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, thank you, Brother Bushman and, and Sister Tejmali and Brother Marini for the preparation and spirit which you've um, 
brought to our, to our meeting. We'll have our closing hymn, uh, 45, Lead Me Into Life Eternal, followed by the benediction by Brother Chris Brewer. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity we've had to come to church today and partake of the sacrament and to uh, remember and learn the importance of self-reliance and the other messages that we've learned today. We're thankful for the gospel and to be members of thy church. We pray we can remember the lessons we've been taught and uh, strive to be better neighbors and friends of those around us. And we say this prayer in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen.